I'll pass the call to Mr David Lembrick, MLC. Thank you, Chair. Thank you again, Attorney General and team. Um, I'd like to ask my first question. Um, with regards to fines under the public health orders, who determines the magnitude of those fines and why is Victoria the highest in Australia? Um, thank you, Mr Lembrick, for your question. There is a... Um, um, a kind of broad government policy um, that I might seek the advice of the um, secretary around what its precise name is, um, but there is a broad um, document that goes to find guidance. And so part of that is about um, proportionality, looking at a fine compared to um, 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 another um, offence, whether it's civil or criminal will also um, depend. So there's a broad policy um, document, um, and when um, an offence or is being determined, this is just as a general matter, government takes advice from um, government departments about the appropriate scale of fines or penalties that might be used. So, so there is the source document that exists, um, and then there is the specific advice. And I just might seek the advice of my secretary around the source document because. Its name I cannot um, immediately summon to my to my mind. Thanks, Attorney. It's the Attorney General's um, infringement guidelines. So, but the fines um, through COVID have been set through the Public Health and Wellbeing Act, um, and the regulations are set by the Health Minister. Yes. So, <clears throat> but those uh, the public th and thank you for that that answer. And so, this is what I'm getting to is that it see it appears that the penalties are under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act, but the Public Health and Wellbeing Act has been amended. Uh, a number of times since the pandemic started. Um, have, these mag have the magnitude of these fines been reviewed and issued? Because I haven't seen any changes in there. Because some of these fines seem very excessive to me um, and to many people, I think. Um, the um, Secretary might make some comments and then I've certainly got something I'd like to add to your question. Thanks, Mr Lynn Briggs. So the, 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 we've kept a really close eye on this because we obviously are, as you know, concerned about the impact on vulnerable people. Mm. Um, so we've been really um, uh, rigid in relation to the um, attorney's um, infringement guidelines set out the percentage um, total under the legislation that can actually be in, in imposed on an individual. Um, and, and so we have really watched that. So the change of the volumes of the fines hasn't changed. And as I said, we always come back to the, the guidelines because they have served us in good stead in terms of that percentage we can actually charge for those fines. Um, more broadly, just in terms of the Public Health and Wellbeing um, Act, the, the, I suppose the policy argument I would make about the need for there to be um, breadth in the severity of those is, of course, um, the state has, in times gone by, um, encountered people who have, you know, done things specifically to do things like um, poison water systems and other things that would be captured perhaps by some conduct in the Crimes Act or the Summary Offences Act, but also recognising that a crime against public health is also a serious matter as well. Thank you. And so the government, I think, committed uh, last week, I think, uh, may have been in a question to you that uh, in, in the lower house that uh, the government will be going after all of these fines and won't be waiving them, including thousands of fines to, to children. But it's, it would seem that a large number of fines would probably get um, dismissed in court, it would appear. Uh, a large number of, a large amount of this revenue probably wouldn't be recovered and would clog up the court system. Why is the government taking this approach rather than a more selective approach? I, I suppose just to clarify um, my answer, um, uh, uh, the, the government or the Department of Justice doesn't waive, doesn't have the power to waive fines. So it is the agency that um, issues and or enforces fines, they bear that, they have that legal ability to do it. Um, right. So um, okay. uh, uh, that was really the position that um, I was um, attempting to articulate perhaps, okay. perhaps poorly. Um, important to note that fines issued to people under the age of 18, they're not registered with um, Fines Victoria. Um, a person under the age of 18 who receives a fine, they can elect to have that matter determined in the children's court. Um, a, a matter that I'm sure the Minister for Police and the Chief Commissioner may speak to tomorrow is they are conducting, correct me if I'm wrong, Secretary, um, a review of all COVID fines that have been issued um, in the course of 
um, in the course of corona um, as well. Um, and there are a range of mechanisms um, in which people under the age of 18 have their fines worked off or perhaps dismissed. And I'll make that as a general um, comment. As I said, fines, fines Victoria don't register fines of people that are under 18 years old. Right, thank you. Um, and back to something that we uh, started on this morning around the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. Um, so on the 17th of September, they asked for some uh, information from the government regarding the reasons for the curfew. So they issued a media release on this, as well as conveying to government the, the considerable level of community concern and confusion that exists. And I brought this up with the Chief Health Officer last time around what information is actually given to the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission with regards to evidence that underlies the public health directions and the human rights charter assessments. Is any of that actually given to the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission? Do they get to review that information? Because the Cho said he wasn't aware. Uh, they certainly can get access to it, and I might get the secretary to um, address it. And that information, of course, was provided in the course of the litigation where the um, curfew. Yes, was I'm aware made. of it. Was, yes. Yeah, made in the litigation, but in more broadly more with broadly, the public health what is directions. Our practice? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it does depend on what the issue is, Mr Limbrick, um, but right through the pandemic, we've made it a real priority to make sure that um, very often, in particular, the Commissioner is well briefed on any action um, the government is taking. Um, so in, in the relation to the curfew, the Commissioner was given a detailed briefing, um, and I think that helped to clear up some of those information gaps in terms of the um, the assessment that was made under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act um, and the work that obviously the um, CHO and in this instance his deputy CHO had made. But more broadly though, um, you know, they've, the Human Rights Commission has spoken many times about, you know, the necessity, proportionality and least, limit, uh, least limiting on human rights and that these are uh, <laughs> necessary under the uh, Public Health and Wellbeing Act when the public health directions are issued. Um, are the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission able to independently validate and do they independently validate these orders that they are the least restrictive and that they are proportionate? Do they have all the information to be able to do that? Because I haven't seen any sort of you know, list of the directions and the Equal Opportunities assessment of those directions and saying, yes, we're happy that they're all proportionate. They've just made these sort of general statements about proportionality. They haven't specifically addressed much at all. So I, I would say, um Two things. Um, the primary decision maker bears the responsibility. So every decision maker, whether it's the CHO in the context of um, public health orders, bears the responsibility around ensuring that it is compliant with charter. Um, any Victorian is free to go and challenge the validity of that decision. In the Supreme Court. Um, in the Supreme Court. Um, they may make a complaint of um, discrimination and they could pursue that at the Victorian Equal Opportunity Commission, but is, as a matter of course, every decision across government that involves um, um, perhaps um, either uh, a restriction or an enhancement or a consideration of the impact on the Human Rights Charter, does every single one of those go to the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission? The answer to that is no, is my understanding, and I'll, I'll, I'll stand to be corrected um, if I'm wrong. Thanks, Attorney. So the Charter does require that the um, authorised officer assesses those charter impacts, but again, it is a case-by-case -case basis. There's no independent role to assess um, with Verioc, um, but, you know, examples I would use is if we were introducing legislation in Department of Justice and Community Safety, we would reach out to Verioc and the Commissioner and talk that through um, and, and get their insights um, in terms of how things play out on, on, in community. Um, so, but it is the authorised officer under the charter who has to make that assessment. Okay, thank you. And so, <clears throat> yeah, and yes, yes, I understand that the, the, the CHO in this case is taking the responsibility. So can I just confirm then, are you aware of the ability of anyone external to the public health team that can independently uh, make an assessment of these directions and their impacts on human rights and the proportionality other than through going through a Supreme Court challenge? Is there anyone that can do that? No, it is through the courts, Mr. It, it is the role of the courts to establish whether or not it's compliant with the Charter. Okay, so and I brought this up the other day. So if someone like me who wants to uh, 
gain some comfort that I'm satisfied that they're proportionate and the least restrictive of human rights. The only way that I've been able to come up with to do that is to go out and assess the actual results on the streets. And like, is that the only way that a, a member of the Victorian public can satisfy themselves that these are the least restrictive of rights? Because it seems very clear to me that there are many of these decisions that are quite questionable about whether they really are the least restrictive and without knowing what the other options are, no one can be satisfied, I don't think, that they're actually the least restrictive. Like, how can anyone know this? Like, the, if, even if the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission doesn't appear to be assessing all these, like, who is? No one, by the sound of it. We can complain to the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. You can pursue some form of legal review. And I would also say supplementing that is the fact that with every bill that comes before our um, Parliament, there is the statement of compatibility um, where you are required to make an attestation around um, the impact on, on various rights. Um, I'd also refer to um, the activities of SARC um, as well, um, a committee that does its job and takes its job seriously. I know this because sometimes I've had my wings clipped um, from a legislative perspective um, in terms of their um, uh, assessments um, as well. Um, and so um, I think that there are a range of, a range of mechanisms and ways in which people um, can perhaps pursue um, those enforcements, but, but not perhaps in the way in, that you've just described. So, do you think that the uh, Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission have performed their function during this pandemic with the severe limitations on human rights that we've seen? Uh, yes, I do, and I'm aware that they're undertaking some current um, investigations and inquiries into that very matter. So I feel assured um, that they will um, and are scrutinising government and government decisions in the course of the response to this pandemic. All right, thank you. I believe I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr Limbrick.